Uh, Iran decided not to renew the petrodollar uh, agreement that they had with the U.S. for, I think, 20 years to be exact. We heard of the uh, Iranian president um, dying in a helicopter accident. These things kind of work hand in hand in tandem when you're trying to do something different. Um, I don't know if your community or your audience has ever heard of the economic hitman. I don't know. Nobody really knows exactly. I think what we do know is that the price of um, oil is going to probably skyrocket in the U.S. because now they have limited trading partners. So last year, the summit in 2023 was held here in South Africa. And in order for President Putin to attend, he had to be granted immunity um, because the U.S. was essentially threatening uh, his arrest. There is this perception, I think, from the West that, you know, Russia is this desolate place that has been destroyed by the sanctions placed on it by the U.S. And Russia is showing, no, we are world class. Um, we are organizers, we are executors, and we are able to put on world-class events like any other country there is. And seeing some of the clips of the summit that was held two weeks ago, I cannot imagine what the BRICS summit is going to look like. The significance of these 97 countries coming to the BRICS summit this year, it's huge. It appears to be Russia. I mean, South Africa has a very unique um, relationship with Russia that I didn't know about until I moved to South Africa and it was why they will never condemn Russia because during the apartheid regime Russia was training um, you know the soldiers that were fighting against apartheid and back then they called those guys the freedom fighters communists they called them traitors they called them terrorists right because they wanted freedom so one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter those folks are already starting to see it, right? Like they're, I think this is the biggest time in history where you've got Americans seeking alternative residencies. No, at no time um, in history has it been this high. I think BRICS is already changing the world. Thank you. Hi, Hayford. Hey, Web Nation family. Thank you for having me back. It's a pleasure. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Hayford, for having me. Shout out to the Web Nation family and everyone that is uh, also a part of the Ashley in Africa community. Um, but my name is Ashley. I have a channel here on YouTube called Ashley in Africa. And I simply share my experience of living, moving, and doing business on the continent. As Hayford mentioned, I started out in Tanzania um, in October of 2020 and have since moved to South Africa. Um, I've created a community of entrepreneurs that are building businesses online. And so we have the Africa Investors Academy, which is that community. And we share resources, um, steps, tools, information, news on the ground, advisors that essentially want to see you win, that are trustworthy, that have been vetted, that are essentially there for people that want to do business on the continent or you know, even just want to invest everywhere from just getting started to not knowing what to do all the way to those that are, you know, closing on 33 room hotels in Zanzibar. So 
it's uh it's an exciting ride we'd love to have you over on the channel come over and say hello Yes. So great question. And I just want to applaud you for bringing this to the awareness of your uh, your community, because this is a, this is something that's happening. Um, there's it's nothing to be afraid of. Right. Um, and this is not anything that we're you know looking to create this uh, this versus that. I think it's just a phenomenal opportunity to watch history unfold and we're living in a great time. And so I'm honored to share because I'm also a student, um, studied economics, have contributed as an economic advisor. And so these are just things I'm really interested in. So it's been exciting to see that other people are also interested in and they're looking at me as um, an expert. So I'm honored to share. Um, and it's also nothing to be intimidated by. So I appreciate you asking these questions. And if there are some things that I don't know, I'll tell you. But for now, I'm hyped and I'm pumped to share this because it's all it's something that if you're making money, if you're spending money um, in the world, you need to know about BRICS, right? So what is BRICS and how did it come into existence? And I do have some notes to make sure that I cover this properly. So BRICS is an intergovernmental organization. I've called it an economic conglomerate on, on my channel as well, but essentially there are, it's an intergovernmental organization comprised of several countries, including Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa as the founding members. And last year, um, the countries that added to that intergovernmental organization were Iran, Egypt, Ethiopia, and uh, the UAE. So some people would like to say, oh, South Africa wasn't a founding member. Well, the first four, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, were formed in, I say, 2009, and at the first summit that was held in uh, somewhere in Russia. And <laughs> then I don't know how to pronounce the name. Uh, and then South Africa officially joined a year later. But I'd like to think that they were involved in the conversation. Um, but because of the nature of intergovernmental relations, there was probably a process that they had to go through to figure out how they could announce this African country. So that's how it started back in 2009. We are in 2024, and there is some steam that is picking up. Yeah, so great question. It is a bit different, right? So the, the original countries are a part of the G20. So all of those countries, they're a part of the G20, but they are said to rival the G7 from an economic perspective. And when we're talking economic perspective, we're just talking about GDP, gross domestic product. This is essentially how much money people are spending in your economy. And the higher the GDP, essentially the higher, the, the bigger the economy. And I'd say this is relevant in most economies. Uh, the main economy where it's a bit skewed is the economy where you can create endless amounts of money without any recourse. So, I think that there are several objectives, um, but the main objective that BRICS communicates is to essentially be a financial architect around um, these new developing nations. Um, they want to be able to create sustainable development. So what does that mean? Well, 
in the past, development from developing nations has always had to go through the Federal Reserve um, because countries were not able to trade amongst themselves using their original currencies, their national currencies. One, so for example, if I'm living in Tanzania and I want to trade with someone living in Ghana, I want to buy some, you know, shea butter beans or I want to, uh, or shea nuts, sorry, not shea butter beans, coffee beans, or you want to buy some coffee. We would have to essentially understand a price, agree to a price and tr tr basically transfer our currency into dollars to be able to trade in dollars, not in our local currency. And that is not sustainable, especially when you have currencies that have to get to 30,000 before they can meet $1. So it just makes it unsustainable. Um, but sustainable, their goals are to have sustainable development. They're not really able to communicate that without clearly stating they don't want the dollar involved, but essentially that is the goal of BRICS is to allow developing countries to develop without the interference of uh, the Western way of banking and doing business. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's about wiping out the dollar. I think what America, uh, let me not say America, US government, right? Because my community likes to critique me. US government has done is they've weaponized the dollar so much that it is essentially kind of biting them in the butt, right? People weren't necessarily wanting to wipe out the dollar. They just want to be able to develop within their own currency. And when you have a government that is constantly weaponizing its currency, um, it puts these developing countries in a really bad predicament and essentially can plummet their economy. But we're seeing the reverse of that, actually. We're seeing these sanctions, like the sanctions that the US placed on Russia during the Ukraine war, um, the, the, the sanctions that the US has placed on China. We're seeing that backfire in real time. And the idea that these countries are desolate and these economies are dying are just not true. Um, Russia's economy grew. Uh, after sanctions were placed, China's ability and innovation technology has grown since these sanctions have been put in place. And so they just want an opportunity to trade fairly and to do business and develop for their their citizens. Yeah, so there is conversation about uh, they're becoming this kind of unified currency. Um, but what is actually more powerful is for countries to trade in their own currency, which BRICS has already developed a payment system that they announced at um, a summit, I want to say two weeks ago, held in Russia. Um, Vladimir Putin announced this payment system that essentially allows people to trade comfortably, safely with their own currency um, through a digital platform. Um, and so we saw this happen. I want to say East Africa uh, created something similar so that the EAC could trade with their currencies. But this is now just on a more global scale where countries no longer have to use the former SWIFT payment system. Um, they can trade with their T-shilling, with their CD, with their RANDs, with their Yuan, and um, yeah, not have to do the latter, which was trade their, you know, yeah, their currency for the dollar. Yeah, I think it's a huge statement. I think it goes back to um, the sanctions. So there was uh, Iran decided not to renew the petrodollar uh, agreement that they had with the U.S. for, I think, 20 years to be exact. 
and said, hey, we're going to trade the way that we want to trade. For those that are paying attention to kind of geopolitics, we heard of the uh, Iranian president um, dying in a helicopter accident, right? So um, these things kind of work hand in hand in tandem when you're trying to do something different. Um, I don't know if your community or your audience has ever heard of The Economic Hitman. Um, I think it's, it's a fascinating read by, um, you know, a former U.S. Uh, official that talks about what his experience was like um, working through economic trade and treaties and, you know, what this looked like from a, a governmental perspective. And so... I don't know. Nobody really knows exactly. I think what we do know is that the price of um, oil is going to probably skyrocket in the U.S. because now they have limited trading partners where before they could control the price of oil because they could control the, the, the strength of the dollar you know, by saying, oh, we've got the biggest GDP, you know, but they've also got the biggest consumer debt you know, as well. So it's kind of like, eh. Um, but I think what we're going to see prices continuing to go up um, for goods in the U.S., um, potentially even a short-term increase in petrol around the world. Uh, but I don't know. It, it is going to be an interesting kind of unraveling of events. But I think what it does do is it creates um, a confidence around these other countries that are saying, yeah, we want to be able to access things that our economy needs to grow. um, And we are going to do that. And now we have an open trade partner that we can trade with. And and it seems like that's what Iran is, is doing. Yeah. um, So things are picking up now. I mean, having the fact that it was founded um, back in the 90s to now, you know, picking up this steam or excuse me, not 90s, the early 2000s um, to now. It's showing one, we've got a conglomerate of countries with different cultures, different languages, different ideologies, different religions, um, attempting to do something that has never been done. So if you've ever worked in innovation or tech, like these type of problems are not easy to solve, but they're fascinating when you can kind of figure out an MVP, which is like the most, um, the market value. Uh, proposition, like why this is going to work. And I think what we're seeing is the fact that it's going to work with countries coming to the table, expressing formal interest, um, attending BRIC summits, attending the games, attending uh, events that are being put on by, you know, President Vladimir Putin. Um, because he's been painted to be this kind of dictator, this, you know, bad guy. And people are coming to the table to hear what he has to say. Um, He's also put himself out there doing interviews. I forgot the guy, uh, is it Tucker Carlson? He did the the interview with, and it really opened up a lot of people's perspective because he really came as a human, as a man that, you know, really just wants the best for his his citizens. And so we're starting to basically just see, mm, I think, a a shift in trust (laughs) or, you know, the the, 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 the shenanigans that, you know, some of the, the countries that are a part of the G7, a part of this global hegemony, they have, you know, just started to show show their behinds, you know, lack of a better term. And people are like, no, I don't think that that's okay. I don't think that that's right. Um, And so we're seeing kind of this wealth transfer, this global shift in looking at something, something different and something that is for the people and not necessarily for uh, 
domination, the domination of, you know, the power structures that have been in that position for centuries. I think it's significant for, for several reasons. So last year, the summit in 2023 was held here in South Africa. And in order for President Putin to attend, he had to be granted immunity um, because the U.S. was essentially threatening uh, his arrest and was getting the pressure from, you know, pressuring South Africa to arrest him um, during the summit. And so he wasn't able to attend one of his, um, one of his, you know, I, I don't know if it was the vice president, but someone attended on behalf of the Russian government and it wasn't President Putin, which, uh, you know, these are the heads of the, the chair of the BRICS um, seat or the president's of each country or the leader the you know if it's um if it's a monarchy the king you know etc so it's significant because the countries are saying you know what we're willing to um come to you you know we'll meet you where you are i think the other thing that is very significant is um there is this perception i think from the west that you know, Russia is this desolate place that has been destroyed by the sanctions placed on it by the U.S. And Russia is showing, no, we are world class. Um, we are organizers, we are executors, and we are able to put on world class events like any other country there is. And seeing some of the clips of the summit that was held two weeks ago, I cannot imagine what the BRICS summit is going to look like this um August in, in Russia. Um, and I think it's just, you know, a statement to say if countries are willing to travel to Russia, it's going to continue to dispel these myths that when you're sanctioned, uh, nobody wants to play with you. And I think it's clear that nearly 100 countries want to play with BRICS. And um, that's huge. I believe that they feel like they can, they have a partner in their development. Um, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And this, uh, I also I always say this economic conglomerate, this, you know, this community of countries, um, I think while they also provide a level of safety to develop, um, I think that there's likely some other elements of protection involved. This is my own, you know, my own assumptions, because wherever there's money, there has to be a level of protection, right? So I think countries feel um, supported by joining a group uh, with the type of, you know, geopolitical power, um, military power um, that is willing to you know, take a stand and do something different. And also just being on a really dope side of history uh, are some of the are some of the advantage. But economically, we will see. I know a lot of countries feel like, hey, you know, uh, specifically here in South Africa, people are like, you know, BRICS hasn't done anything for the modern person. And I think when you're experiencing something like this, a global shift, um, it's going to be a top down experience with the um, the new development bank is based here you know in South Africa and the initiatives that they're they're focusing on the that type of creation of such an economic um, stake being here in South Africa being here on the continent of Africa for me is a visual representation of the belief that BRICS has in the future of Africa now, some may say, oh, that's just kind of visual. But I think what that means is each country is looking towards Africa and saying that this continent is where uh, we can really be intentional about sustainable development because historically it has been nothing. It has only experienced, um, you know, pillage. It's only experienced, 
you know, the removal of its minerals and its wealth uh, to these other countries. Now we're going to bring an anchor that says this is where the wealth is and this is where we're going to develop it. There are three countries in South in Africa that are a part of BRICS: South Africa, uh, Ethiopia, and Egypt. Yeah, I don't know, right? I don't know how what their process is. You would these are huge countries with big ego, right? Big GDPs. Um, and I'm not sure how they're able to collaborate on these economic policies. What I do know is if you break down each country, you can see where each country's strength lies, whether it's agricultural resources, manufacturing resources, um, talent, um, consumer market, um, you know, mining, you know, minerals, like each country brings something to the table that the other country lacks. And so however they're coming to create these policies, um, it's I'm sure probably a very thorough process uh, and something that has some level of checks and balances that uh, protect them in the long run. I've got notes. <laughs> so since 2011, the National Institute of Statistics of the BRICS group of countries um, produced an annual joint statistical report, basically to put out statistical information and perspective of all of the different countries, right? So they've been doing this since 2011. Um, and it's, it serves as like a single data platform for the mutual benefit of participating countries. So they've got to report their statistics. They've got to be transparent. And I'm sure there's, again, like some type of checks and balance there. Uh, but there's also the optical fiber um, bricks cable that is being created. It's part of the motivation for the project when... Uh, Someone was supposedly spying on what was happening. Um, they wanted to create some type of fiber optic cable so that they could have a bit more control of that communication. Um, and let's see, there was some a letter of intent signed at the 2019 summit um, to incorporate the information, information and communication technology sector on what this would look like long term. So how they could maintain some type of uh, communication channel that would be absent of hackers or spies. Um, and so I think the biggest one is the new development bank uh, that, like, as I mentioned, is here based here in South Africa. And their whole, you know, the whole mission of the new development bank is to create projects that are sustainable development projects. Um, and these include, uh, there's been some bridges discussed, all of these, I'm not sure which have been funded and which things are still in process, but this is a big shift, right? And I want people to realize like this stuff isn't going to happen like overnight. It's going to take time. And these are really major things, um, that are happening in the process. But yeah, there are just some developmental projects that are in the works, um, and I think since last week of them announcing this new payment system, it is going to make all of these things a lot easier moving forward. Yeah, it's, I mean, their role is to create and foster sustainable development within the BRICS nations. Um, but they haven't really clearly defined what that means long-term, uh, but practically it's just to be successful, right? Like they've funded, each country has funded this bank and said, we're going to contribute X amount of monies to be able to be distributed under our countries for development. Um, and 
there's fiduciaries involved. I think it's also another way to remove the money from each individual entity and say, we're gonna put it here in this pot and we're gonna agree on this project, this project, and then this project. Um, and then, you know, what that looks like over time. I think what they're trying to secure is success in being able to execute on each project. Yeah, um, and this is not financial advice or investment advice, but I think how you benefit is you educate yourself. Um, you know, what you're doing in educating yourself, like that's a huge investment. We like to be very mindful of that as creators. The best thing we can do and invest in is, uh, is high level skills. And so researching is a high level skill. Uh, choosing to get your information from more sources than just one platform is a is a high level skill. So there's that, right? Educating yourself on what is actually happening, um, and being open to what you hear, and that what you're hearing may not be what you have been taught, right? So that that's a huge part of it as well. Being open to the fact that everything that you've been taught could very well be wrong, or could very well be um, no longer relevant in in the current geopolitical landscape. And then I also say like, you know, explore, visit these countries and see what's happening. You know, see what's happening, see what they're up to. And if you can't visit them physically, then spend some time in, in understanding what type of content they're putting out um, and what they're sharing they're doing outside of it coming from a Western media source. Like that's really, really important because um, like I said, going back, a lot of us have been taught when we live in the West that, you know, Russia and China are the bad guys. You know, they're the communists. They're the they're the uh, dictators, you know, and I mean, it's just not been my experience interacting with, you know, Chinese and interacting with with Russians and kind of seeing what what they're opening the world up to. Um, but I think it's important that we visit these countries, we learn about them. Um, and then if we like what we see, then we spend significant time and money there. So for me, my decision to move to the continent was not because of BRICS, but it was because I saw the economic trajectory that the continent was headed towards. And I saw the economic trajectory or the economic decline in the in the country that I was currently living in, as well as the societal decline, right? So my ability to invest or desire to invest came from not just hearing about it, not just seeing content about it, but actually spending time connecting and seeing where I could add value or where I could participate in the growth of said country. So that's really where it starts. There are some conversations about investing in digital assets that um, are creating these financial payment systems through the blockchain. Um, if you know, you know, like there are some of these uh, cryptocurrencies that are being discussed. Um, that's a way as well, but it's just so important that we educate ourselves and like fix these money blocks. You know, we're so quick to say, oh, I don't understand that let's throw it away. Um, but we have a very unique opportunity to pay attention um, and, and kind of see how we can participate in this economic and wealth transfer that's t currently taking place. So I think the significance, the significance of these 97 countries coming to the BRICS summit this year um, is really, it's huge, right? So the 97 countries are participating in the BRICS games, right? So it's not, um, they're not all saying we're going to join BRICS, but the fact that these countries are agreeing to send a representative as well as an athletic team shows a, a different level of camaraderie and unity that isn't often present in politics, 
right? So having experienced uh, economic development, working in economic development when I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, I learned there that culture is the number one indicator of whether a person is going to make a move to a country. And so when you're able to engage with different cultures, different languages, different uh, religions, different ways of living, thinking, being, you create a camaraderie and a unity that surpasses uh, political power. It's now we're humans and we're competing against each other, but we're essentially uh, experiencing a level of camaraderie and social engagement. And I think that willingness of these 97 countries to do so in a Russia that is supposedly, you know, this country that is on its brink um, is, is very powerful. And it shows that not only are countries looking to relate human in a human way, they're willing to do so in a competitive sports arena around a huge economic moment in history where uh, there's conversation of changing the entire economic structure. structure. So it's very significant and it's something that shouldn't really kind of be passed over or taken lightly because Russia puts on, I think they hosted the World Cup, um, the year is escaping me, but they put on world-class events. They can, they will, and this is not going to uh, disappoint. So I'm looking for an invitation. This is my second um, invitation, inviting myself. So if anyone in your community is watching this and they have a relationship, I'm, I want to go. I don't know, right? Like, what is what what options do we have? Um, what options do we have, really? I, I think we can talk all day about what we could be doing, why we're not doing what we should be doing, why we're not like the Chinese or the Indians or the Pakistani, right? But reality is what I've learned in my life is you can only create change through creating something new. You cannot constantly look behind you and say, that should have been this way and this should have been. So where we are is we are a developing continent that needs capital uh, and needs uh, skills to develop and who's coming to the table with the intention of sustainable development um, who is stating that clearly who who are matching their words with actions and it appears to be Russia I mean South Africa has a very unique um, relationship with Russia that I didn't know about until I moved to South Africa and it was why they will never condemn Russia, because during the apartheid regime, Russia was training, um, you know, the soldiers that were fighting against apartheid. And back then, they called those guys, the freedom fighters, communists. They called them traitors. They called them terrorists, right? Because they wanted freedom. So one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And I think we've been, we've been condition to paint these folks as terrorists and I'm not sure that that's accurate right we as an American I'm seeing the things and the impact that my home country has had on the world because I'm on now on this side of it and I'm looking and I'm like wow guys like people do not this is why they say people don't like Americans not because we're black Americans but it's because of some of our decisions that we've made over time that are essentially catching up to us. Um, and I still have hope in our ability as a nation to figure it out before um, we're completely ostracized from the game. But until we match our words with our actions, um, quite frankly, I'm not sure that we can be trusted. Um, you know, I think for the average American, you're probably not going to see a lot of change. If you just kind of like to go about your day, you're used to spending $300 a week on groceries, you're used to spending $150, $200 to fill up your gas tank, 
your travel maybe once a year to a you know place in the Caribbean or Mexico, um, you're probably not going to see any major shift outside of prices continuing to go up. Um, so if you're not, you know, interested in globally expanding your reach from an investment perspective, from a residency perspective, from an intellectual perspective, you're probably not going to feel it. Um, and because my experience is that Africans are just very much geopolitically aware. Like we know what's going on in every country because that is the media gives it to us um, that way. And so, you know, but if you um, are a higher net worth individual, you're global, you, you're, you travel globally, um, those folks are already starting to see it, right? Like they're, I think this is the, biggest time in history where you've got Americans seeking alternative residencies. No, at no time um, in history has it been this high. And, but I, I, I think the challenge there is it's got people thinking, if I'm not rich, I can't make that move. And if you have a, des a desire um, and you have an income or you have an idea that you can create into an income, you can participate in this. I don't think that this is something that only the wealth are going to be able to participate in. If you have a mind and a willingness to learn and know, you can, um, you know, you can benefit or at least be on even keel. But if you're going to kind of just move along, go with the flow, you're definitely going to be able to expect your cost of living to increase and your quality of life uh, to likely decrease. Yeah, great question. And I forget too, right? Like you have such a, a wide audience. So this audience isn't just US. This is Canada. This is the UK, parts of Europe. I know that people watch your content from all over. And so when I talk about these G7 countries or I talk about the US, I'm also including these G7 countries as well. Um, these traditionally uh, superior from an economic perspective, um, what do you call empires, right? The, those guys that have been reigning for centuries and kind of making this uh, hegemony their, their strategy. Um, and so if you represent someone from that space and you want to learn more, I think the first thing is, yeah, like be critical of the content that you consume. Um, again, be open to, to learning or unlearning some of the things that you thought you new based on what you've been taught um, and be open to considering that these other places in the world are not as bad as they want you to think. Um, but I do believe that something like this change is harder than in the beginning than it is over time, right? So it's like going to the gym. You haven't gone to the gym in 20 years, <laughs> you know, like You've never, you haven't worked upper body and lifted heavy weights in months. Um, it's going to be, you're going to be sore. You're not going to be as strong and you're going to be sore for a week or two before you feel like you can get back in and train upper body. This is essentially what is likely to happen in some of these countries um, where the change is disrupting the status quo and it is going to be a lot harder in the beginning than it is in the long term. But if your risk tolerance allows you to experience those things, then I think you'll be successful. And I mean, at least that's what I'm banking on because I'm banking on that risk that I've taken um, to ultimately be a long-term success for not only myself, but my family and the legacy that I'm helping to create for other families as well. I also don't know. I think we like to, one of the main feedbacks that I get from people, like points of reference is, 
this is never going to happen. And if it's happening, it's not going to happen anytime soon, right? Well, we all are old enough to remember where we were 10 years ago. Um, and then we can also remember where we were 20 years ago. And if we're being honest, they don't, it doesn't feel like it was 10 years or 20 years. Like, it just doesn't feel like that because we remember it like it was yesterday. But if we look at our life over that 20 years, a lot has happened, a lot has changed. And are we in a, did we use that time to serve us? Was that time for our good? So I'd like to say that, you know, in 10 years, we're not going to, or 20 years, we're not going to recognize um, the, the status quo of uh, global trade. It's going to be completely different than what we know it to be today. And, um, you know, I just want to be on the, the positive side of, of that change by just being aware and being open to the things that I don't understand um, and be willing to make mistakes along the way. I think BRICS is already changing the world. I think the mere fact that a week well, not a week, maybe two months ago in a video, I talked about how I didn't necessarily uh, disagree with, um, what is the term? Um, they say that Putin was a dictator, right? And I said that and people were like, how could you say such a thing? It's because that's what I was taught, right? And then when I understood like, oh no, he's been elected and president, like people want him in that position and this is why he's been in that and he continues to stay in that position. So I've shifted myself in my understanding of a leader as such powerful as, as, as Vladimir Putin. And that one shift is allowing me to open up and see things in a completely different perspective. So to me, it's already changing the world. Um, the impact, I don't think anybody is that's trustworthy can really measure what it will look like. I'm just, I'm grateful to be able to share this type of content, it excites me. Um, as a constant learner, I invite you to also do your research. If this is something that interests you, you know, study it, research it. You're going to be around a lot of people that are going to tell you, and you're going to share it, right? And people are going to tell you things, ah, that's nonsense, you know. Um, trust yourself and be willing to explore the unknown. It's such a interesting place and space to be in um but you might surprise yourself of what you're able to accomplish in that space of unknown whether it's exploring what life looks like on the african continent or exploring what life looks like away from your traditional home country or the place that you've been born and raised um yeah i'm just i'm an advocate for opening ourselves up and expanding ourselves to the opportunity of what life looks like when we play in an area of, of the unknown. So, come on. Yes. yes, I do. Um, and for people that really want to get more insight of on the ground content of what's happening from an economic or political space, you can subscribe to my newsletter. It's called the AIA Insider. Um, it's just going to be it's a rich email weekly about what's happening on the continent um, from an economic and political space. And if you 
are interested in what life could look like, travel could look like, business could look like for you on the continent, I would love to work with you. You can schedule some time with me um, by getting on my calendar. That link will be in the description as well. And um, our academy is currently closed, but we'll be opening up enrollment later this year, 2024 fall. Um, and it is for entrepreneurs that are getting started or that are already kind of on their way. Um, that have an interest in building a business on the continent, but also want to be able to build something that they can work and uh, create from anywhere. So they can work and live anywhere with the intention of living and building something on the continent of Africa. So all of those links will be below. I would love to work with you. I'd love to have you in the community. Um, come on over to the channel, subscribe, and yeah, let's stay connected.